Okay, so we continue our discussion about sums, and now what we're going to do is we're going to relax several conditions that we had made previously about computing areas. So then let's say that we want to consider a function between A and B. So here's X is A, and X is B, and we're going to consider a function that uh, is defined on the closed and bounded interval A to B, but this function may not be continuous. It might not be continuous. So previously we were talking about continuous functions, but now we're going to talk about functions which might, might not be continuous, and they might be really, really not continuous. Right? So then uh, I'll just draw as simple of a function as possible, right? and I'll make it not continuous. But understand, it could be significantly less continuous than this one. <coughs> okay, so then what we, what we want to do is we want to find the area that is under this curve. Find the area that's under this curve. And we're going to do it in the same way we did it before, which is to say we're going to partition the interval. But now, previously we had said that the partition needs to be an even partition. That is to say that it's evenly spaced. And we called that spacing delta x. But now what we're going to say is that, okay, it doesn't have to be evenly spaced. It can be spaced however you wish. Okay, so then I'll make a partition here that is not evenly spaced. <coughs> okay. So then an additional... So then there's, you know, I've partitioned it into one, two, three, four, five, six regions. Okay, that's how they're going to be. You can see that they're not evenly spaced. Okay, the next thing that we did is we said, well, we, we defined two different sums, the lower sum and the upper sum. The lower sum was obtained by taking the lowest value of the function and using that, and the upper sum was obtained by using the greatest value, <coughs> and we use that. So then now what we're saying is that, okay, we're just going to sample anywhere in here, anywhere in this interval, and sample the, the function there. So let's say here, in this region, I'll, I'll say where I'm going to sample. And these are just, I'm randomly choosing some position. So I'm going to sample at that one, and then maybe right in the middle for that one, uh, on the end point for this one, in the middle for that one, here for that one, and maybe there for that one. Okay, so then when you do that, you obtain rectangles that look like this. So here's a rectangle. So you can see this rectangle in the last region is a little bit under the curve and a little bit over the curve. So it's a little bit under, a little bit over. Okay, similarly, here's another rectangle. A right, little, bit, little bit under, a little bit over. Okay, so then now I'll quickly get through the rest of these as fast as I can because we're in a hurry. Okay, so then now, we're saying that that's an estimate. That's an estimate for the area that's under that curve. Now, because we sort of just randomly chose sampling points in each one of the intervals, I can't tell by inspection, am I overestimating or am I underestimating? I don't know, right? With the lower sum, you are always underestimating. And with the, over sum, uh, with the upper sum, you're always overestimating. But this sum, maybe we're, maybe we're underestimating, maybe we're overestimating, maybe we got lucky and we just happened to get it exactly. It, it's not clear. Okay, so then specifically, now that you sort of have the picture, let's write down the, the uh, exact legal math terms. So then let's say that we are given f of x defined on the closed and bounded interval A to B. It is not necessary for F to be continuous at all. It just needs to be defined. Okay, <coughs> And we're going to let X0, X1, all the way to Xn be a partition of the closed and bounded interval A to B. That is to say that 
a is equal to x0, which is less than x1, which is less than x2, which is less than all the way this continues to xn minus 1 is less than xn, which is b. Right, so all that inequality is saying is that's all of the little green, the green bars that I made. Right, it's, the, it's the red vertical lines and the green vertical lines. Okay, and there's n of them, and this n could be uh, 7, as it is in my picture, or it could be 7 trillion. Okay. So then now, further, <coughs> further, we will let ci be sampling points. in the partition. Okay, that is to say that x i minus 1 is less than or equal to c i is less than or equal to x i. So then these, right, these correspond, these c values correspond to the pink ones. Right? That's where we sampled. So those are the pink ones. And these x i, they correspond to the green bars, right? The green bars. Okay, so is everybody seeing how the language is corresponding to the picture? Okay, then, now, the sum, okay, the sum defined as follows, summation from i is 1 to n of f evaluated at ci multiplied by Oh, I forgot. I need one more thing. Okay, so then now, delta xi, right? So in the previous sum, the previous sum that we were dealing with, delta x was constant, right? The width of all of the intervals was the same, but now the width of the intervals is different, is different. So delta xi, delta xi is xi minus xi minus 1, right? That's just a fancy way to say the width of the ith interval. Okay, so then now, the sum f evaluated at ci multiplied by delta xi is called a Riemann sum. Okay, so then Riemann, after a very famous European mathematician named Bernard Riemann. <coughs> okay, so then now, just as a matter of fairness, as a matter of fairness, I would say that really, it, this is not exactly a Riemann sum. Really, this is uh, a Darbo sum. Right? Because this is not exactly what Riemann did when he did this for the first time. It got refined significantly by a later mathematician named Darbo. Okay, but the book makes no mention of that. I don't know why. Okay, so then, are there any questions about what a Riemann sum is? So what it is, it's a relaxation of what we were talking about previously. So previously said, we're only going to deal with continuous functions, okay? We have relaxed that. The function can be not continuous. Furthermore, we were talking about, we were talking about functions which were, st which were greater than or equal to zero, right? This could be, this could be less than or equal to zero. Right? So then they don't have to have the same SIGN all the time. Okay, previously said that we said the partition needs to be even. Right, needs to be uniform, but the partition now is not required to be uniform. And previously we said that you always have to sample at the lowest or the highest point of the graph, and now we're saying that you don't have to sample that either. Right, so we've, we've relaxed as many restrictions as possible. Okay. <coughs> so then, <coughs> with, this being, with this being given, okay, we have the following uh, definition. So this is the definition of integral. Okay. <coughs> so let f of x be defined on the closed and bounded interval a to b. Let xi be a partition in the manner that I described on the, on the previous page. So partition. 
and let ci be a sampling in the partition. <coughs> okay. So then what I'm saying is it's just we have the same setup as before. But now what we're going to do is we're going to say, we're going to now use limit to try and see what will happen. Right? What if we limit, make a limiting process on this procedure? So then, <coughs> the function f of x is said to be integrable integrable on A to B if the following limit exists if the following so the limit as now I'll explain what this means in a minute the limit as the norm of delta goes to zero of the sum from i is 1 to n of f of ci multiplied by delta xi exists. So if this limit exists <coughs> for all partitions and for all samplings so this limit must exist for all partitions and for all samplings and it must always uh, have the same value so exists and is the same so then now I'll, I'll explain what the what the delta thing means in a minute. But what this is saying is this. It, if you compute the limit, okay, as the partition is becoming as fine as possible, and I, it, it, it works for any partition, and it works for any sampling, and this limit always exists, and it is always the same value, okay, so then what we're saying is that you can really be really liberal how you're going to try and cut this up. You can cut it up with unequal partition. You can sample it anywhere you want. And if no matter what choices you make in the partition, and no matter what choices you make in the sampling, the limit always exists and it's always equal to the same value, then the function is said to be integrable. Okay. So then, here's a note. So note, this is called the norm of the partition par I did that again partition and it is equal to is equal to the maximum over all i of delta xi so the norm of the partition is right we made that partition x0 less than x1 less than x2 less than x3 blah 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 the norm of the partition is the biggest one so what I'm saying is that not the partition doesn't have to be uniform but what we're saying is that that the largest the largest sub interval that you are choosing has to go to zero so if the, if the largest one is going to zero then all of them are going to zero okay so any question about this okay so then finally If f of x is integrable, so integrable on a to b, then we use the following notation. The limit as the norm of the partition goes to 0 of the summation from i is 1 to n of f of ci delta xi. Right, so then this is a lot of writing to get point across, so then we want to have a shorter way to write this, and it is written as so. So this okay, is the antiderivative symbol, right? So it suddenly has shown up again, and now you put 
a down here and b up here and then f of x dx okay so this is notation right the right hand side of this equation is a shorter way to write the left hand side of this equation the reason why you can write the right hand side like this is because we said that it doesn't matter how you partition and it doesn't matter how you sample so all this all this talk about delta xi and xi and ci none of that matters so we're just gonna say x right it's okay to write the right hand side like this because all of those choices don't matter okay so any question about this okay so then Just as a remark, as a remark, um, now we have the following very important thing. It is, if we are given, <coughs> given f of x, which is continuous on a to b, closed and bounded interval, okay, there are two consequences. One. If I give you a continuous function on a closed and bounded interval, then it is integrable. Okay, that is to say that there are lots of functions which are not continuous, which are nevertheless still integrable. Okay, but if I give you a continuous function, it's certainly integrable. Right? That's far more than what's required for integrability. Okay, second. If f of x is greater than or equal to 0 on a to b, then the integral from a to b of f of x dx is the area under f of x between a and b. So if it's not positive, right, if, the, if the function could possibly be negative some of the time, then it's not necessarily representing an area anymore. But if it is positive, if, if it specifically if it's greater than or equal to zero, then it is representing an area. Okay, so any question about this? Okay, so now I have a question for you. Just a purely geometric question. We still don't know, we still don't know how to evaluate this expression. Right? And very soon, we will know how to evaluate it. But we don't know how to evaluate it yet. But we do know that it means area. So I could ask you the following question. I could say, I want you to use your geometric reasoning to tell me the following. So here is, here is uh, an axis. And here is the top half of the circle, and I'll say that this is the graph y is equal to the square root of 4 minus x squared. Right, so you can see, you can see that there's an area. Okay. The formula, the formula for this area, it has lots of formulas, but we could write it with integral notation as follows. We could say that it is the integral from where to where. So where do you start and where do you stop? So you start here, and where is this? X is equal to what? Okay, not, so I, a, is, a is what we were calling it, but I want a specific value. So where do you start? At negative 2, right? Negative 2. And then this is where you stop, and this is X is equal to what? 2. Okay, so then, so then, the, the integral formula for this area is the integral from negative 2 to positive 2 of that function, the square root of 4 minus x squared dx. That's the integral formula for this function, or for the area of this region. So then now, using any geom geometric formula you know, tell me what the area is. What is the area of that region? It's half of the area of a circle of radius 2. 
right? Because that's, that's the top half of a circle of radius 2. So it is 1 half pi times 2 squared, right? Which is uh, 1 half times 4 pi, so 2 pi. Okay, so any question about that? Any question about that? <coughs> Okay, so then another geometric one I could give you, I could say, well, um, oops, I could say, here's some nice shape. Uh, let's say that it looks like this. Okay, that looks good. So this will be the graph. <coughs> The graph of y is x plus 1. The graph of y is x plus 1. And let's say that this is mm, x is 1 and x is negative 1. Then you can see that, oh, okay, there's an area here. Right? And you know, you know that shape. That shape is a what? Triangle. Okay, but now I want you to write the integral formula. Please write the integral formula for this area. <coughs> okay, so you should have the integral from negative 1 to 1 of x plus 1 dx. Okay, we don't have a means to evaluate this expression yet, but now you can just use geometry to figure out what it is. This is a triangle with base 2 and height 2. So then it is 1 half the base times the height. So the answer is 2. Okay, so any question about this? Okay, so now we need to talk about some properties of the integral. Okay. So then, 1, the integral from a to b of f of x dx. So then what if I switch this around and I say the integral from b to a of f of x dx? What do you suppose algebraically will happen? The sign will change, right? If you switch the, if you switch the order, then the sign changes. Okay, that's sort of like saying, you could think of it like this. If you are, if someone is paying you money, then you're handing, they're handing you dollar bills, right? And so you're getting paid. Okay, but if now the procedure is done in reverse, you start giving them, then you are obtaining negative payments. Okay, <coughs> so then another important property <coughs> is that what would this represent? So someone tell me geometrically what this would mean. Sorry? Yeah, the area under a single point. So how much area is under there? Zero, right? There's no area in there. Okay, so the answer is that the integral from A to A for any A is zero. <coughs> okay, three. Okay, so then now, Let's try and think about this. What about the integral from a to b of f of x dx plus the integral from b to c of f of x dx? Okay, so then now, this one deserves a picture. Okay, so let's say we had the following. <coughs> so here is x is a, x is b, and x is c. So x is a, x is b, x is c. So then now, the integral does not require a continuous function, but I'm going to draw a continuous function just because it's easier. Okay, so then, 
Now this, the integral I'm underlining in green, right, this corresponds to this area. Right, corresponds to that. And this one that I'm underlining in pink corresponds to this area. the green area and the pink area. So my question to you is, is can you take a look at this picture and see that, oh, well, the sum of the green and the pink area is really just the integral from where to where, A to C. Okay. So this is the integral from A to C of f of x dx. Wonderful. So any question about that one? <coughs> any question about it? Okay, so then now, more properties for the integral from a to b of k, right, some constant k multiplied by f of x dx. Okay, so then now, f of x is the height of the, represents the height of the rectangle that you're using as you move left and right. Okay. And dx represents, is a stand-in for the width of the rectangles you were using, right? So then that's why you see all of the integrals look like f of x times dx, because that's height times base, which is the area of one of those particular rectangles. So then now, you know, if I put a box just around these, right, then you can see what the effect of multiplying by k, what that does is that multiplies the height of the rectangles by k. So all of the rectangles, all of their heights are multiplied by k. So what will happen to the new area? It will be multiplied by k. So that's what I'm about to write. So this is equal to k multiplied by the integral from a to b of f of x dx. So for those of you that are going to go on with this kind of mathematics and things like this, this is called homogeneity. This is the same property that the derivative has, right? If you, if you have a constant times a function, you compute its derivative, that constant just hangs out, okay? just like the integral. Sorry? Homogeneity, yeah. <coughs> okay, so then the next property, right, the integral from a to b of f of x plus g of x dx. Okay, this is the integral from a to b of f of x dx plus the integral from a to b of g of x dx. Which is to say that you can do them separately. Right? This property is called additivity. Okay, so then what that means is this integral procedure is homogeneous and additive, which means that it's linear. Okay, for those of you that are going to study mathematics. So the integral operator is a linear operator. This is very important. It's one of the most fundamental things that <coughs> makes it work the way it does. Okay, so any questions about this? <coughs> any questions about these things? Okay, so then now, finally, finally, we can get to the point to where we can compute some things. So all these things, we, we describe this procedure of integration just abstractly. And I said that it has to have all of these properties. Okay, but now we actually need to be able to compute these things. Right, so that I say, do it. And then you say, OK, I'll do it. OK. So the way that this is computed is the topic of section 4.4 .4 and the name of section 4.4 .4 is called the Fundamental Theorem of, cal of Calculus. Okay, so that really, I would say that the author's exposition in this chapter is sort of strange. He calls something the first Fundamental Theorem of Calculus and something else the second Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. And I'm not really sure where he's coming from on that one. The one that he calls the second fundamental theorem of calculus to a mathematician is the fundamental theorem of calculus. The first one is a consequence of the second. I'm not really sure what he's getting at here. <coughs> so, but I'll just go with it to not be too 
strange if you happen to look at the book. So then, this is what the author calls the first fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, and it is the following. If f of x is continuous, on the closed and bounded interval A to B. <coughs> and big F of X is any antiderivative of little f of X. Right, because we already talked about how to compute antiderivatives. Okay. So if f of x is continuous on the closed and bounded interval a to b and f of x is any antiderivative whatsoever, <coughs> okay, that is to say that the antiderivative of f of x dx is big f of x plus some unknown constant, then the integral from a to b of little f of x dx is equal to your antiderivative evaluated at B minus your antiderivative evaluated at A. Okay, so then this, this right here is the connection, right, as far as computation is concerned between the derivative and the antiderivative and the integral. What this is saying is that you can compute the area, okay, you can compute this integral as follows. You first compute an antiderivative to find big F. You plug in once, you plug in twice, you subtract, and that's the answer. Okay? So then let's do an example of this to make sure that the computation is clear and then we'll see why this is a, is a fact. So for example, so for example, you'll remember that last time we did, uh, I said I want you to find the area under the cubic x cubed from 0 to 1. Do you remember? And then we said, okay, we'll partition it evenly and then use the upper sum and then compute the limit of the upper sum and then we obtained some nice value and then I said, now, imagine that we did the exact same thing with the lower sum and compute a limit and obtain a value. You will see that it is the same and then this common limit of the lower and the upper sum we're saying is the area. Do you remember that whole long procedure? Wasn't it great? Okay, let's do that again but let's do it like this. What I was asking you to do was the integral from 0 to 1 of x cubed dx. Of x cubed dx. So then, according to this procedure outlined above, we would say it like this. So first, first let's compute the antiderivative of x cubed dx. So what is it? x to the 4 over 4 plus some unknown constant. And this is telling us that what is big F in this question? X to the 4 over 4. Okay, then second now. The integral from <coughs> 0 to 1 of x cubed dx, according to the fundamental theorem of calculus, is big F evaluated at 1 minus big F evaluated at 0. Okay, that's what the fundamental theorem of calculus says. So then, this will be 1 to the 4 divided by 4 minus 0 to the 4 divided by 4. Okay, 1 to the 4 is 1, 0 to the 4 is 0, so altogether this is a fourth. Okay, so any question about this? Okay, so then now, in fact, this is not how most of your computations will proceed. I just wanted to do this one very verbosely so no little thing was left out. But there's a much more common notation that is used. Okay, so this is called just the evaluation bar. Okay, so then this, this notation, f of x, and then a bar a to b, Okay, this is a bar. This isn't a bracket like the author thinks it is. It's a bar. <coughs> okay, this is just notation for this. F of uh, B minus F of A. 
And for that reason, the fundamental theorem of calculus is often written like so, which is sort of nice because it makes it look symmetric. Okay? So let's do one more example to make sure that the notation is clear. <coughs> so for example, uh, not A to B, we'll just say like, uh, I don't know, 0 to 1 to make it easy, and then I'll say x cubed plus uh, 3x squared plus 1 dx. Okay, so then now we'll do all of those kinds of steps that I did on the previous example, except we'll do them sort of all simultaneously. So then now, the antiderivative of this expression will be x to the 4 over 4 plus x cubed plus x. Right, can you see that that's what it would be? Okay, now I don't need to write plus c. I don't need to write plus c because the fundamental theorem of calculus says it works for any antiderivative. Okay, which means I can take c to be whatever value I want, so I'm going to take it to be 0. So then I won't write plus c, and now I will use the evaluation bar to say that this is to be evaluated between 0 and 1. Okay, so then I can say that this is equal to 1 fourth plus 1 plus 1 minus 0 plus 0 plus 0, which is... 1 fourth plus 4 fourths plus 4 fourths is 9 fourths, and that's the answer. Okay, so any question about this? <coughs> any question? 9 fourths. So then, this, this is a cubic, okay, and it looks like this if you were to draw this situation. So then, we're only between 0 and 1. So between 0 and 1, so x is 0 and x is 1. Now all of these terms are positive, 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 positive between 0 and 1, or at least they're not negative. So then this looks something like this, I would guess. Okay, now this area. Does it have a name? Is that a named shape? No, it's not a named shape. But it has an area, and its area is 9 fourths. <coughs> Other questions? <coughs> Other questions? Okay, good. <coughs> so what time is it? Nine more minutes. Okay, so I'm trying to see what we can get done in nine more minutes. <coughs> Lots of stuff to do. Okay, so then, are there any questions about computing these, these integrals? Okay, now I'd like to point out something to you. So I gave you an integral on the previous page, not the previous page, but a, a previous page. I said, I want you to compute the integral from negative 2 to 2 of the square root of 4 minus x squared dx. <coughs> so then now, we were able to eventually evaluate it. right? We were able to figure it out, but we had to use geometry to figure it out. So the reason we had to use geometry is because this particular expression, right, that expression, Unless you've taken a calculus class before, you have no idea how to compute the antiderivative of that expression. Right? You would just have to blindly guess. Okay. Okay. So then, uh, the purpose of me telling you this is so that you know sometimes I'll give you a I'll give you an antiderivative that you don't that you are an integral that you do not know how to evaluate. And you don't know how to evaluate it. You don't know how to compute the antiderivative. But but if you think critically, you can look at it and say, oh, well, this, this is actually bounding a shape that I know, like a rectangle or a triangle or whatever. And then you say, ah, I've got it. 
Does everybody see that? So you have to be able to know right, what you're looking at geometrically. Okay, other things that are important. <coughs> Okay, so then two remarks here. So first off, remind me what it means for a function to be odd. What does it mean for a function to be odd? Yes, right? So then, let's say that we are given an odd function f of x on the symmetric interval negative a to a. Okay, so then that is to say that f of negative x is negative f of x. Now let me write that up there so I have more room. So f of negative x is negative f of x. So what that means, what that means is that we have a picture that looks like so. So here's x is negative a and x is positive a. So then you know, it looks something like that on that side, and it looks reflected on the other side. So then now, this area right here, right, you could compute that area, the area of the right-hand side, and that area would be some positive quantity. Now, something that hasn't been made clear to you possibly yet is how about this area that I'm going to shade in green? Right, that's an area, it has an area, but if you were to compute the integral of that function between negative a and zero, what would the SIGN of the result be? It would be negative, right? So it would be like, this would be like, maybe you consider this to be uh, a graph of, of how you are paying money in time. So then this would be, you're making payments Right, because that is to say money is going away from you, so you're making negative payments. So you're losing money. So this quantity will be negative. This would be like, this is the time where you are getting paid, so you're getting positive payments, so you're accumulating money. Right, so then this is a negative area, and this is a positive area. So now I have a question for you. What a, how are these two values related to each other? Right, they, they're equal in absolute value, but opposite in SIGN. Okay, so what I'm saying is that what will be the integral of this function, an odd function over a symmetric integral, uh, interval? It will be zero. It will be zero. It's say you, you're losing a quantity and gaining a quantity. So then, if that's the case, then the integral from negative a to a of f of x dx is zero. Okay. So then now, besides being odd, what else can functions be? Even, right? So then if we are given an even f of x on a symmetric interval negative a to a, and that is to say that f of x, uh, excuse me, f of negative x is f of x. Then now the picture, now the picture is something like this. So x is, a, uh, x is negative a to x is a. So maybe you get some, some shape like that, and then it is symmetric on the other side. <coughs> so then, pink area, green area. 
Okay, so then now, the integral from negative a to a of f of x dx, right, that's this whole area. You could say that how is it related to just the integral from, say, 0 to a of f of x dx? You double it, right? You double it. <coughs> okay, so another, another game that we like to play very frequently is something like this. I, want you, I, get you to, I ask you to compute the integral of a function, but you don't know how to compute the antiderivative of that function at all. You don't know how to compute the antiderivative. However, it is an odd function, and you can show that it's odd quite easily, and it's over a symmetric interval, and so then the answer is what? Zero. Okay. But in order for me to give you credit for such a response, you have to say, this is an odd function for these reasons. This is a symmetric interval. Therefore, the integral is zero. Okay, so does everybody get the idea? Okay, so lots of times I'm going to ask you to compute integrals that you don't know how to, you don't know how to compute the cor corresponding antiderivative. But for other reasons, you will still be able to make a conclusion about what the integral is, either from a geometric argument or an argument concerning the oddness or evenness of the function. Okay, finally, <coughs> the second fundamental theorem of calculus. The second fundamental theorem of calculus is this. <coughs> if f of x is continuous, <coughs> then the derivative with respect to x of the integral from a to x of f of t dt is f of x. Okay, and this, at least according to a mathematician, is the fundamental theorem of calculus. All that other stuff is just a consequence of this one. So what is this saying? What this is saying is that if you compute an integral, right, you take a function and you perform an integral procedure on it, and then you undo this with the derivative, then you get the original function back. So what this is saying is that this kind of integration procedure from a to x is the inverse operation of differentiation with respect to x in the same sort of way that multiplication by 2 is the inverse operation of division by 2. Right? They are inverse operations to each other. Okay, so then the way this works, well, we don't have enough time to, to, to show you the way it works, but let's do an actual example, and that will just have to be enough. Okay, so for example, uh, let's compute the uh, let's compute the derivative of the integral <coughs> from how about uh, 4 to x of the square root of t squared plus 1 dt. So this will be example number one. Okay, so then, now, you don't know how to compute the antiderivative of the square root of t squared plus 1 dt. You don't know how to compute that antiderivative. But fortunately, you don't have to. Okay, this is just the square root of x squared plus 1, according to the second fundamental theorem of calculus. So any question about that? <coughs> okay, one more. Okay, and this, what's in, uh, this next one is what's going to happen when the chain rule comes into play. Okay, so then what if, what if we compute the derivative with respect to x of the integral from x squared to x cubed, say, of the sine 
of t squared plus 1 dt. Ah, so now it's, this is starting to get complicated looking. Okay, so then this will be the sine of x cubed squared plus 1 multiplied by the derivative of x cubed multiplied by the derivative of x cubed and then minus the sine evaluated at x squared squared plus 1 multiplied by the derivative of x squared so let's sort of try and see what happened here so what is happening is that I'm computing the difference between two things and that that is what you, this should be an echo for you of big F evaluated at B minus big F evaluated at A right? the difference of two things so what happened here is I took this X cubed right, and then plugged it in for T right so X cubed squared and then plus one and I took this X squared and I plugged it in for T so I got X squared squared plus one Okay, and then these pieces right here, these are actions of the chain rule. So then all together, all together, to finish out the answer to this question, this will be sine of x to the 6 plus 1 multiplied by 3x squared minus the sine of x to the 4 plus 1 multiplied by 2x. Okay, so then now, I, I want to make one more observation before we go for the break, and that is, notice that there is a common term in here. What's, what is a common thing that's in this expression? x, right? I could factor out x and say that this is x multiplied by sine of x to the 6 plus 1 multiplied by 3x minus the sine of x to the 4 plus 1 multiplied by 2 and so now now <coughs> if I say if I say that I take this expression right here this integral and if I was to name that if I was to name this thing we're computing the derivative of, say, h of x, then this would be the derivative of h of x. And so if I call this thing inside of here h of x, then this is its derivative. Now, have a look at this expression. Can you see any critical numbers? What would be a critical number? zero would be a critical number because if I was to plug in zero then the derivative of h would be zero there may be others but algebraically they're too complicated to figure out at this moment but at least one of them is zero so the purpose of me telling you this is because I want you to see uh, this last example I promise this is the last one okay so then here is a function f of x and I'm going to say that it is the integral from one to x of 1 over t dt. Now 1 over t dt, you don't have a name. You, you don't have a name for the integral for, of the antiderivative of 1 over t dt, but this is an extremely important function that we will deal with later. But what I want you to see is that this, right now what this notation is allowing us to do is we can define new functions that you simply did not have access to before. Right? I have defined a new function. And this function represents the area under the curve between one, uh, between one and x of the curve one over t dt uh, of the curve one over t. This we will learn about what it is after the break, but you can tell me right now what is the derivative of f of x. What is its derivative? One over x. For those of you that have taken calculus before, you should know the name of this thing. What is its name? The log. Okay. <clears throat> See you after the break.
It was too much to do today.